Thanks everyone for joining us today for the Let's Talk Computing Science and Gaming Symposium. It's an honor to have you. Uh, so as Don mentioned, this session we'll be talking about video games and its relevance to the field of computing science and also of its impact. Um, so let's start with a round of introductions. So my name is Sharif Nasser, and I grew up playing a lot of video games. And it was actually one of the reasons I decided to study computing science, even though I had no background uh, programming. Uh, so I went to university and studied quite a bit uh, about computer science. And currently I'm working as an iOS engineer and um, at Twitter. But in my free time, I also like to use Unreal Engine and follow the game development industry. I've been doing that for the last four years. And it's been a quite exciting journey, uh, even though it's something I do on my free time. Um, so I'll pass it over to the panelists and I would like to start with Professor Helga. Okay, yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, as introduced, I'm an assistant professor at UBC, and I don't really do games myself. I don't program games myself. I'm not in the game industry, but I do give a game uh, a lecture on video game programming. So um, yeah, I'm closely closely related to that. And if you're a professor professor at the university, you essentially have two big parts uh, that you have to deal with. You have to teach and you have to do research. So on the teaching side, I have one course on AI, one on video game programming. On the research side, side I work on computer vision and machine learning and AI. So I, I can talk about uh, a bit about both of these. And yeah, I think with that, I pass it on. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, next up, Kate, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, hi, uh, my name is Kate. Um, I've been playing games my entire life, uh, but despite doing some a bit of game programming in high school, I got it in my head that I wanted to study biology, changed my mind, went into computer science. Uh, then I worked for a few years in uh, digital publishing and e-readers doing full stack web development before I got picked up by Skybox Labs. And I spent the last two years with the team uh, working with Wizards of the Coast to bring Magic the Gathering Arena to mobile. And that's pretty much me. Sounds fantastic. Awesome, and next up, presenting Chloe. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Chloe. I've been a AAA game developer for the last 17 years. I'm a computer science graduate uh, from like 2000. Uh, my parents are both math teachers, and I'm a math nerd, and I'm also a video game nerd. Uh, I play a lot of games, mostly MMORPGs, but uh, I, yeah, so so games is my life, literally <laughs> my bread winning and where I put all my money. Um, yeah, that is me. Cool, pleasure to have you, Paul. Mm -hmm. And finally, follow Henry. Hi, everyone. Um, so I don't do gaming, but I have brothers, four of them. <laughs> I love gaming. Um, I'm a. I was an IT major. I was an IT major undergraduate, and um, yeah, that's all. Cool. Thank you, Paul Henry. It's great to have you all here. All right, so let's kick things off with uh, some interesting questions. Um, so just like many people out there, I love playing video games, and I, it's an amazing medium for. Um, entertainment and to spend your free time to socialize. Uh, so that's on the consumption side, but I want to hear from you. Uh, what makes video game development exciting? Well, for me particularly, I find that video game development is, is exciting because in the last 17 years that I've done it, I've learned so many things. I've My role has changed many, many times since I started in the industry. And there's really never a moment where it gets boring. And even if you did stay in the same field, like programming, a gameplay or something, um, there's always advancement, like the, the apparition of augmented reality or virtuality and things like that will, will make like the next year very different from the previous ones. So it's very challenging constantly. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely uh, second what Chloe said with, um, e even on a smaller time scale, like Chloe is kind of talking about over the course of her career, but over a single project in a couple of years, I've kind of changed hats a number of times. I've tried a lot of things and got to explore and even push forward um, 
new technologies, which has been really amazing. Like seconding kind of what Jeff was saying about games being so amazing because it's such an interdisciplinary field. If there is a type of programming you want to do, there's a very good way to find how to do it within games. Um, and yeah, as a result, it, it's never boring. <laughs> Yeah, I like the overall concept. Essentially, gaming is all about creating virtual worlds, right? And you can imagine whatever you want. There's no boundary. It's it's your, just your imagination. So that that's why I think I, I got into computer science by trying to program some games. I never got very far, but um, it was just fun to imagine that getting doing a few steps in that direction. Yeah, these are all great points. I totally agree with each and every one of them. And I follow the same, same path as you guys. Um, it's just exciting to imagine something and dive deeper into it and see if you can make it happen. So with that said, now it's not all fun and dandy. I'm sure there's some obstacles along the way. Um, so can we talk a bit about what are the challenges of making video games? Who wants to start? <laughs> I can start. Um, I think one of the biggest challenge of the video game is also why it's so interesting is that you work with very often giant teams. Uh, so I'm personally used to ridiculously big productions because of where I worked. Like Ubisoft has about 3,000 employees in Montreal and most Assassin's Creed games are developed in eight different studios uh, to help us. Um, so, so one of the biggest challenge in games is, and not only is it super massive and therefore like requires a lot of communication, but it's also like hundreds of people who are super passionate about what they're doing. So they actually get really into it. Like most people will want to fight for what they believe is right because they everyone wants to make a great game. And it's actually really hard to make sure like all your employees are on the same page and that the direction you're going is the direction that is the best. Uh, so so it's, really, it's really hard to wrangle all of that. Um, from my personal experience, uh, like my, 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 my smaller personal experience, we, we brought um, Magic onto phones, which is a very complex card game. It was built as a game for home computers, which have a lot more processing power and a lot more screen space. And I find something that's very interesting, but also very challenging about developing games, especially when you're working in the mobile space or a portable game, or even just bringing something to consoles, you are working within a set of like screen size constraints, uh, performance constraints and such that you have to bring this like vivid, interactive, uh, very satisfying experience to people, despite the fact that you've got all these constraints. So you're trying different tricks to hide things from the player as they're doing things. You're trying to optimize things. You're designing in certain ways so that it feels good, despite the fact that you're more constrained on the screen or something like that. Um, and so tackling those problems is very difficult. You have to be very creative and um, work with a lot of very smart people to get through those problems. But at the same time, when you solve them, it's extremely satisfying. Um, I, I um, feel like the a big, um, I guess, like hard part when it comes to gaming would be like the usability for, especially for someone with like disabilities. Um, I feel like um, the, like the human computer interaction like it's very important when it comes to the games because um someone who is blind or deaf like they might not they're not going to see the game as someone who isn't blind or deaf so like, keeping those in mind is very important when it comes to development of a game that you want everyone to be able to play not just people who um, are able to just naturally listen and see a game but thankfully, technology is has been, you know, like being more inclusive for all kinds of people. So that barrier is slowly but surely, you know, being bridged. It's interesting. You you all talk more about design issues than really programming difficulties. So is is that just something you 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 do at the side, and the, like at some point you you learned how to program, and the, the difficult things are elsewhere. Oh, when I when I'm saying design in the the scenario that I'm describing, it's also a software design uh, mm -hmm. problem where you are designing um, 
you're designing code, you're architecting code and optimizing that code to solve the problem in a way that is both satisfying to the player um, as far as feel, visually satisfying, but also doesn't cook their phone. <laughs> yeah, and the user experience point and accessibility is actually a really important one to talk about um, because this is something that is often thought of near the end of the project, but if you don't build your entire structure straight from the start with that in mind, it can become really difficult to actually put those accessibility features in later. So, so the, the actual foresight of knowing you will want these and placing systems in place right from the beginning when you start building the engine so that near the end of the project, you finally have your menu with your options and they work. That is actually really hard. The, the programmer, the lead programmer uh, of UI was also the chief accessibility and user experience person at IDOS Montreal. So for the Guardian of Galaxy game that came out recently, that has been a huge focus of his life for the last like four or five years. And well, they're getting a lot of praise for the accessibility as now that the game has shipped, but it has been an uphill battle the entire way. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, and it's definitely a big challenge. And like Chloe said, I believe, yeah, if it's not baked in right from the beginning, it gets harder. But there have been advancements in uh, even hardware. Like there are accessibility hardware that, you can, that I've seen people use on Twitch, for example, uh, to play video games that are not like your traditional mouse and keyboard. And that's always been quite interesting. I uh, believe Solahani might have dropped. No, she's still there. Um, cool. So speaking of investments, um, so computing science is an ever-evolving field. Um, and I'd like to hear from you, uh, what advancements in the field of computing science have played a major role uh, in video game development industry? I can start again. <laughs> the normal um, order. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I, personally, I want to say that uh, one of the biggest one that, that I like, came from computer science, but has been integrated in games is, is definitely machine learning. It, it now like used in motion matching. So animation uses it quite a bit. It's used in AI significantly, but even, even other application exist uh, for machine learning. So, so I wanna say that this is by far the greatest like change that happened in the recent years that didn't actually originate from games, but that games benefited from. How is it with database systems? Do you use them a lot? or Because I, I think that's a huge part of computer science. Like uh, every second job in computer science, if you're not in gaming, you're going to do something with databases. Uh, for all the assets and storing these, is there a lot of database management going on? Or? Database is probably one of the biggest concerns for certain types of games. The type that I play a lot and that I actually know a lot how they're made, like MMORPGs are just massive amount of information for each player and the world. And, and yes, database very often is the number one constraint for features requests. Like a designer may say, I want this. And then engineers will be like, we can't store that data. Like we, we just can't. <laughs> Uh, because it just gets ridiculously big when you multiply by 10 million players. Uh, so that makes a massive amount of data. And then everything starts getting slower when, when you have like to send too much packets. Yeah, when you're considering how information flows like both from the client to the server and back from the server to the person who's actually playing the game, there's a lot of considerations to be made as far as like you, you, you're even thinking at the level of UI design where you're thinking, how is someone going to proceed through the game and what information are they gonna need when? And how can I package that information? How can I most efficiently load it and transport it back and forth between a database, which might be a little bit slower to access and it's going to have a lot of people coming at it at once um, versus do, do I actually need this information right now? What subsets of that information do I need? Um, there, there are a lot of things to consider. And yeah, especially as games definitely become 
this the standard for pretty much every game these days is there's some aspect of networked data that goes on and every single thing that you load up is probably living on a server somewhere and it's someone has th had to think about um, how they're going to get it out of there in a way that's not going to uh, crumble under the load of 10,000 people trying to get at it at once. So if you don't mind me talking just a little bit more here. Uh, so, I mean, for databases, we've had a huge leap in uh, this, like this speed. And also we have the, a lot of distributed systems now. Do you, do you think that's still a huge concern, like on, for example, on server side, um, where you're not able to store enough data since you can have faster access and also you can have more, uh, more nodes to access at any given point? Uh, sorry, I think I, I missed the question in there. Uh, so the question is whether a uh, database, um, like the restriction of the size of the database and lookups uh, is still limited by speed since now we have like SSDs and um, even M2 drives and also distributed systems that allow you to um, have distributed data. So you don't have to like search one database. You can actually like, like, like you can have a set of data that you're only looking for. Looking through. Well, well, developing um, distributed systems and designing your databases to accommodate that kind of approach is is a problem in databases itself that we you're going to still be solving on a project by project basis. Um, how you lay out your data uh, informs how you can actually distribute it. If things are inherently associated, you're not going to be able to split them up across multiple databases running on multiple machines. Um, and Though we do have more powerful hardware, um, the scope of the problems that we're solving, um, the size of the audiences that we're approaching are still growing um, at the very least proportionately to that, um, to the technology. So we are still working around the technology. We, we haven't escaped the limits of uh, storage mediums yet, unfortunately. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah to, to, to bounce from that, like. SSD solid state drives are for people who don't know like really fast hard drives because they don't use like the magnetic disk that spin. Um, and, and VME is like a more recent form of that where it's it's even closer to your CPU and everything. So it, 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 the access speed is even more ridiculously fast. Um, the thing is for the massive database and the scale of things, that that and the speed you need for having like good responsiveness for games like MMOs and stuff like that, you will often find that an NVMe is just not fast enough. You will have computers that have literal terabytes of RAM and they literally run from RAM only because like actually going to files is, is would be too slow. Uh, and what happens is those machines will have an NVMe and they will eventually like take the RAM and, and put it there and save it for real. But for the majority of the time, it actually is live data um, because that's, that's just like the, the kind of speed we need for the sheer amount of data we're often dealing with. Awesome, wow, that's, that's pretty crazy. I never thought like, how much performance is affected. Um, I always thought like, you know, with, it, with what we have now in terms of hardware, a lot of these wouldn't be issues, but clearly I, I'm, I'm mistaken there. So thank you so much for clarifying. Yeah, I think um, a good way to think about it is like, even if you've got something like an NVMe drive installed in your computer and you turn on your computer, the amount of time it takes to get from turning the computer on to getting to your desktop does take a decent amount of time because you're processing a good amount of data. And while you know, you're know you one user that might be asking for more data out of that, that drive than a single user who's hitting a server to try and log into a game is, if you've got tons of users coming in, you're effectively asking for that information. You don't want to get bogged down um, at any point because every moment that the server is trying to get that data, someone is on the other end waiting for that. And if someone clicks a little menu and they want to say, look at their stats from their last match in a game, um, and they're stuck there waiting, that feels terrible. That feels uh, terrible as gamers. We want everything to be fast 
and yeah, it it you you want to you want to see your results. Um, so that's that's why it's still very important to be working uh, towards performance on database end. Yeah, totally. It's all about real time. Um, cool. So I want to shift the topic a little bit towards uh, examples where video game development has benefited other industries. Um, yeah, I'll give you guys the floor. So, so I want to say that the most, like the first one that comes to mind right now would be like the Mandalorian, which has essentially been made in Unreal, which is like a game development engine. So I think that's a very clear sign that uh, real time rendering and the power of, of like our video cards and our hardware is now at the point where it's comparable to what used to be things that would be rendered over like weeks of, of work on oh, like computers with like, like movie software. Um, yeah, like huge farms, huge yeah. rendering farms just to get a frame in an hour. Yeah, real time in now. Um, but like another example is massive armies like Lord of the Rings movie types where actually asking animators to make every single soldier fight is ridiculous. Like you are seeing 10,000s of soldiers on the screen and they have to look like if somebody decides to take a magnifying glass and look at that orc fighting that elf, it has to look like they're not just doing, otherwise your movie will kind of like, what's going on? So, so they're essentially using AI. Like they, they're, they, they are teaching those characters how to fight and telling them, go fight uh, because and, and that comes from essentially the same thing we do in games. Uh, and that saves like thousands of hours of animating all those like background characters. Um, so I've got a specific example. It's actually from my own company. So uh, something that we've brought out into taking experience that we've learned from games, um, since a lot of our development is with the Unity engine, uh, we've actually broadened into like VR simulations uh, and construction to support the mining industry in BC uh, and support uh, construction industry. So they come to us with problems they want to see modeled and to be able to actually step into with a VR headset. And we can take the experience that we've learned from games and provide a service there so they can make better informed decisions about life critical things like mining. That was pretty impressive. I think it's all very entangled. Also, just the demand for graphics processing. Like without gaming, we wouldn't have GPUs, these graphics processing units, or a special piece of hardware on your PC, which is just meant for rendering. And then, yeah, it was developed for gaming, and now we're using it for simulating cars, simulating mining experiences, and this whole whole VR world. And actually, also the machine learning, it, it's running on the same GPU hardware because it can actually kind of the, the first machine learning experts where abuse the the rendering hardware to run their machine learning models on it in more efficient ways. And so, yeah, I think we wouldn't be here without gaming uh, with all this machine learning hype we see today. Awesome. Uh, so we just have a few minutes left and I would like to just wrap it up uh, mm -hmm. by asking if you have any advice for those who would like to get involved in computing science uh, based on your experience. I, I think I want to make one comment. We have heard a lot of stories today, and mine is probably similar, that people got in, in computer science and gaming early on in their life. Um, that was, I guess, the easiest thing to, to get there, or the idea, maybe the only thing to get there a couple of years ago. But nowadays, it it's, doesn't really matter. Like If I look at the students who study computer science, they come from all over the place. They, they come from different cities, different countries, different um, groups. Of society so it doesn't really matter you don't need to be, be able to program but it's great if you already reach out and start googling for how to get into machine learning and all that but it's so totally not necessary like one of my best friends and really really good student he didn't know how to program a word and then i started to study computer science so you can totally do it you, you don't have to be already engaged when when you started it's going to be much easier if you can but um that shouldn't hold you back yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I met a lot of people when I was going through my degree who had never programmed before, with, and they picked it up very quickly, um, especially UBC's program. I, I went through it. I thought it was amazing. Um, the thing I will say, um, kind of once you're at the education level, your education is going to go so far, but you definitely want to like push yourself outside of what you're doing in class. Um, it, it may not be now, but once you've learned some basics, 
um, an event that you can get into that UBC actually hosts that I found immensely beneficial for furthering my career in games is uh, uh, game jams, uh, hackathons. Global Game Jam is probably the big one. UBC hosts that. Uh, I, I don't know if you're hosting it on site at UBC anymore. It used to be. Um, but that's a great event. You can go there even if you've never made a game before. You can find a team. You can just get together. And by the end of a weekend, you'll have made something that you can actually show to people. And there are always industry representatives there. Definitely recommend talking to us. We're not scary. <laughs> we were in your shoes probably more recently than you think. Um, and we were always happy to talk about games and game development and how you can further your career there. If you're excited, we're excited. Um, so I know I, I'm a recent graduate. I graduated literally May of this year. Um, and I can honestly say that when it comes to like um, the whole comp sci world or technology world like first of all you have to be asking questions do not be afraid to ask questions even if you're the only one like that raises your hand it will make you a lot more wiser and take more accountability for your education because i know like there's been so many times where i didn't know what i was doing and if i just sat there and just stayed like you know, with the information I know, I was limiting not only myself, but my peers, because there's most likely someone else who needs an answer to the question that you have. So you're also helping them out too by asking those questions. Um, and then secondly, I'll also say like, it's very important to have like professional development when it comes to like having, um, LinkedIn is a very good platform to use when it comes to like networking with a bunch of different um, people in different fields. You can easily reach out to people on there who have similar jobs that you're interested in or the company that you're interested in. They may work there and not necessarily only for like a reference, but like this could be like a, a connection where you just get to know more about the job without actually working there. And you can actually see, OK, maybe this is a job I would, I would like to work at or this is a job I wouldn't like to work at. Um, and it's just, I just think networking just helps you to grow as a person, just being surrounded by um, people who are in similar fields or different fields, you get different perspectives through networking. So that's my greatest suggestion. You can also add me on LinkedIn too. Um, it's literally my name on LinkedIn. So I would love to network with everyone. So yeah, that's my advice. I'll, I'll also second that. If you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm under the same name, Kate McKenzie, if you'd like to reach out and talk about uh, the games industry or what you can do to learn programming, just please hit me up. And to, and to bounce from all of those topics we just had, um, AAA game development and indie game development are two wildly different beasts. And depending on what kind of person you are, so if you are super curious and want to touch everything and do everything, indie games will actually serve you much better. While if you actually really like to go deep into one thing and become like the one expert person on how human eyes work in order to make them perfect in a game, there is a job for you. So, so like the AAA is way more about specializing and has like a different title for pretty much everything you can think of. And sometimes you just need to learn that such a role exists. You're like, wow, there is a person somewhere that's job is to do that and exactly that, and that's my one passion, awesome. Actually, like, use that, like, sell yourself as the expert at that thing. Um, and the other piece of advice I would give is that you miss every shot you don't take. So, like, when it's time to send in resumes and cover letters, don't, don't hesitate and self-censor yourself. Like, Go out there and, and send them and get those first interviews where you're probably going to stumble and fail, but there will be learning experience. And, and the, at the worst, you'll actually have made a human contact in human resource in a random company. And you never know, they can actually call you back three months later because they finally have a job that fits your passion. But you have to communicate that in that interview or that cover letter that you sent um, because that's that's... This industry is way more about who you know than what you know. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I, I totally agree with that. Like, um, and kind of off of like firing out, um, not like 
don't miss out on opportunities. Like you look at a job listing, maybe you don't perfectly meet it. You can still throw your hat in if you're excited about it. Um, like I got my current job, despite the fact I'm, I'm working with C Sharp and Unity. I had never touched either of those things before I joined my current company. I happened to just meet my current director at a gaming related event. We ended up just chatting about programming and beer and all that fun stuff for a while. And I, I ended up here. Um, so you never know where things are going to go. You are, aren't necessarily underqualified, even if you think so. Um, there's opportunities out there and there are people who will recognize that you are, you know, an interesting, cool person with plenty to learn and things will happen. It's great.